Thank you very much for being here and being part of such a se wonderful celebration of this 50th anniversary. I'm so glad to be able to join you and to be representing the National Endowment for the Humanities and bringing greetings from our chair, William Bro Adams, who's disappointed not to be able to attend himself. I'd like to start this evening by talking a bit about the founding of the agency and some of the themes that have been important to NEH throughout our 50 years. I'll next particularly focus on our work with Michigan and then move into a more future-oriented wrap-up. As you've heard, the enabling legislation for the National Foundation for the Arts and Humanities was signed into existence by President Lyndon Johnson in September 1965. This legislation includes the statement, the arts and humanities belong to all the people of the United States. This commitment has been central to our work ever since and continues today. We were created as a federally funded independent grant making organization and continue to function in that way. Since our founding, we have made more than 63,000 grants, totaling $5.3 billion, and also leveraging an additional 2.5 billion in privately funded matching grants. NEH grants typically go to cultural institutions such as museums, archives, libraries, colleges, universities, public television and radio stations, as well as in support of individual scholars. Each year, we convene more than 1,000 independent experts on hundreds of external review panels in a wide variety of fields. These panels rate the applications that have been submitted, which are then reviewed by our staff and forwarded to the National Council on the Humanities, our advisory body, which meets three times a year to review these recommended applications. As a federal agency, we of course are very attentive to ensuring that our support through our multiple grant programs is distributed as widely as possible in order to bring the humanities to all Americans where they are. Having said that though, our funding is relatively small compared to the enormous variety of important humanities activities that are happening nationally. As such, our funding often functions as a signal for the excellence of individual projects, even when we can't fund the entire cost, which then enables grant recipients to garner additional support from other private funding sources. Mindful of this importance of, of bringing the humanities to all Americans, our focus now is particularly on the chairman's initiative, the common good, humanities in the public square. This theme is best captured in some of the new grant programs we have put in place, including, for example, the Public Scholar Program, through which we award fellowships to humanities scholars whose work is intended for the general public, or the Common Heritage Grants, which are awarded to cultural institutions in local communities throughout the United States to help them capture and preserve their local heritage for future generations. The grants we award through our more than 30 grant programs also serve to, for example, strengthen teaching and learning in schools and colleges, such as through teacher workshops on America's Industrial Revolution at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, or to facilitate research and original scholarship, such as the recent public scholar grant to Mark Clegg at the University of Michigan, to write a cultural history of the Star-Spangled Banner. To preserve and provide access to cultural and educational resources, such as the grant to the Keweenaw Bay Ojibwa Community College to collect and preserve oral histories from the elders of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, and to strengthen the institutional base of the humanities such as our support for the Marquette County History Museum to open a new facility downtown with children's classrooms, artifact storage, and exhibit areas. That gives you a sense of some of our recent activities. Let me now spend a few minutes on some particular highlights of the past 50 years of our grant making. For example, NEH played a significant role in changing the standards of documentary filmmaking all the way back to our support for Ken Burns' first documentary film about the Brooklyn Bridge, 
and his Civil War film 25 years ago, as well as many of his films since then. Overall, we've supported over 1,900 TV, radio, and film documentaries. We've supported blockbuster museum exhibits, starting with the King Tut exhibit, which traveled in 1977 around the United States and was seen by over six million visitors. And we have worked and continue to work to provide public access to Chronicling America, the website through which 10 million pages of digitized newspapers from the late 19th and early 20th century from across the country and Puerto Rico are available for free, working with our partner at the Library of Congress. In addition to awarding these and many other grants, we also think it's important to honor individuals and groups whose work has deepened this nation's understanding of the humanities and broadened our citizens' engagement with history, literature, languages, philosophy, and other humanities subjects. We do this through the awarding of the National Humanities Medals. These medalists are chosen by the White House in consultation with the NEH and presented by the President in conjunction with the National Medals of the Arts at an annual White House ceremony. Since 1996, when the first National Humanities Medals were given, there have been 175 medals awarded, both to individuals and organizations. Past medalists include Pulitzer Prize winners Philip Roth, Annie Dillard, Jhumpa Lahari, and Larry McMurtry, essayist Joan Didion, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Elie Wiesel, sociologist Robert Coles, poet John Ashbery, and filmmaker Steven Spielberg. Finally, I would mention our Jefferson Lecture Program. The Jefferson Lectureship was established in 1972, created by NEH to honor the intellectual and civic achievements exemplified by Thomas Jefferson, our nation's third president. This lecture is free and open to the public and exemplifies the values of NEH's founding, which is so still true today. Past Jefferson lecturers have included authors Toni Morrison, Tom Wolfe, and John Updike, historian David McCullough, playwright Arthur Miller, cultural scholar Henry Louis Gates, literary critic Helen Vendler, filmmaker Martin Scorsese, and actress and playwright Anna DeVere Smith. In addition to these many examples that I've mentioned already, NEH actually dedicates the largest single percentage of its budget to the support of more than 50 state and territory humanities councils, such as the Michigan Humanities Council, of which you just heard in that video. These state councils are independent tax-exempt organizations with dedicated staff members, board members, and volunteers who work tirelessly to create and maintain humanities programming that speaks to the needs of their local communities. In Michigan's case, this programming includes a variety of activities, such as the Primetime Family Reading Program, a grant to an exhibition currently on display at the Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame, and this particular program was funded as part of NEH's Standing Together initiative, which seeks to promote understanding of military experience and to support returning veterans. The Michigan Humanities Council also sponsors the Great Michigan Read, which for the last five years has had residents across the state engaged in literary discussion of a selected book. And with that, let me now turn to the next 50 years, which begins, from our point of view, with the culminating event of this anniversary celebration year, a symposium presented by the University of Virginia and sponsored by the Mellon Foundation, which will focus on the future of the humanities in all its various visions. This will be held in September of 2016 and will include speakers, workshops, presentations, and discussions, all public events and all web accessible to focus on all the futures we can each and all imagine for the critical role of the humanities in our world for the next 50 years. The public relevance of the humanities has never been more important. 
The role of an informed citizenry in the life of this country matters significantly and will continue to matter going forward. So many of the pressing issues we face today require the participation of all citizens and are enlightened by bringing the humanities to bear in all our considerations. Whether it is the understanding of the relationships between humans and the natural world, addressing the challenges and opportunities presented by the changing demographics in many American communities, or deepening the public understanding of the meaning of democratic citizenship in the 21st century in relation to our founding principles and values, our political history and our current circumstances, the role of the humanities has never been more central to who we are and how we will move forward as a nation, ensuring equity and access and the continuing strength of our country. As much as this was critically important in 1965, it is every bit as true now and will be in the future. We at the NEH look forward to supporting all of this work as the future unfolds. Thank you very much.